Welcome, Ankiti, to the Kalari Behind the Scenes podcast. Really appreciate you um, taking the time. And, uh, you know, I've watched how you have uh, really, really been a role model uh, pioneer in a very difficult fast fashion uh, business and uh, getting your learnings and insights and sharing that with the audience today. I'm truly excited and thanks for joining, Ankiti. Thank you so much for having me, Vani. You are the real pioneer, so I'm super excited to do this. So, Ankiti, the first question I have is all around customer experiences, right? You have managed to create a a different and wonderful customer experience, and there can be an opportunity in of itself by how new companies can compete against incumbents or create radically new ways in which uh, customers uh, engage, right? So did you have a very clear vision of how you wanted customers to engage from the very beginning? Is that core to the strategy of a startup? Should it be core to the strategy of a startup? I think, Ani, uh, it should be core to the strategy of the startup to figure out what is the best way for the customer to engage uh, with with you and you know with your platform in our case the customer is often a person that's running a fashion brand or uh, an sme or sometimes it's actually a bigger fashion brand or a direct to consumer brand as well uh, i think we uh, if we would have you know when we started the company there weren't so many fashion digitization supply chain players right so we didn't really have a known prototype to improve on so we were doing a lot of unknown things so i think broadly what we understood was that it's a very archaic industry it's a black box and obviously we need to simplify it we need to start making it transparent uh, but we didn't have a day one answer. And I think uh, for me personally, I always think of it as better is the enemy of good. So build something, get feedback. I trade, build something, get feedback. I think in the whole journey of Zilingo, we've evolved so many times, both in terms of product as well as even business model. And uh, I think one of the things that keeps us nimble and cockroach-like is just that ability to constantly accept that maybe our answer, our first answer, maybe our second answer was not the perfect one. And it was not meant to be the perfect one. And I think that's true for product and product experiences as well. You create something which you hypothesize as what the customer wants. Uh, You take the feedback and you keep improving. If you wait for perfection, perfection is usually, you know, the enemy of what's good and what's needed. Um, and the cost of perfection is too high. So Ankiti, you have an insight into global supply chains in a way very few people do. And of course, uh, COVID and the pandemic continues to change and impact uh, in ways that we won't fully know uh, today and uh, for what that means to future. But we can assume that the fashion industry as we understand it today will go through a lot of uh, uh, changes. And so when we see resurgence happen, which inevitably will a year from now, sooner, a bit later, what is, who do you think could win and how can, you know, startups continue to play a role in uh, this uh, industry from next generation transformative companies? Is it all about digital first brands, something else? What do you think? So, Vani, I think in the entire fashion and lifestyle space, even beauty, there are very clear trends that have emerged in the last one year. Maybe it was in the making before COVID as well, but COVID has aggravated and accelerated some of these trends extremely well. And I think it's very clear what is a winning strategy and what is not a winning strategy. I think before COVID, there was still some confusion on how how fast the industry needs to digitize and so on. Now digitization is a given. Sourcing needs to be digitized. Supply chains need to be transparent. You know, all of that stuff is a given now. And it's a question of how quickly businesses are able to do so uh, and, and so on. So, so, so just, just to go into some of those trends, right, especially in fashion and maybe some on, in, on, on beauty as well, because it's because it's interesting. Um, so one is, uh, you know, in the last year, if you look at the performance and let's say market cap, the companies that were direct to consumer 
and had more digital uh, footprint or had the agility to move to digital as COVID happened, performed 13% better than everybody else in the fashion industry, while the traditional players actually fell by 11%. And of course, as we all know, some traditional players did very badly and you know some players went bankrupt as well so this was a year where and this is all sort of public information right but this was a year where like companies like macy's and debenham struggled because they were not you know they were not ready or suited for that kind of you know agility which was necessary in the same year where companies like lululemon and nike actually did really really well right and and lululemon has already been uh, always been a good direct to consumer great company but nike is obviously a company that has shown great agility over time so uh, so so the same year where some fashion and lifestyle companies suffered terribly and the overall fashion market fell a few which were focused on digital and direct to consumer strategy actually just completely outperformed the market so that, that's obviously one. And uh, it's a pretty obvious thing, but it's just, you know, the numbers are now all there, the year is over. Um, and you can see the difference in performance. So there were super winners and there were losers. There were some losers. The second thing is um, uh, around categories and product mix and how people are viewing what they want to consume in fashion and lifestyle, right? So, uh, so I think it's an oversimplification, but I'm going to say it. But, you know, casuals, athleisure, uh, sort of smart casuals, business casuals, all were flying because, you know, we were all doing Zoom calls. Um, and even though travel was, you know, completely stopped, people were still hiking around their house. So, you know, your leggings and your athleisure categories, your exercise categories were doing very well. Not just clothing, but all kinds of accessories associated with that were doing really well. And of course, companies that were, you know, very focused on formal wear and, you know, that sort of uh, you know, suits and things like that were not doing so well. Now, some of them had the agility to move to these new categories or launch new categories, new collections, new influencer collections in these categories that would work. And some didn't. And again, I think that had a lot to do with the fate of the companies at the end of the year. Uh, you know, there are companies that have been, you know, for decades leaders in um, men's formal wear who are now very close to bankruptcy. And there are all these companies that are making leggings that are just doing so well, right? They're selling leggings on Instagram and they're, you know, triple digit million dollar revenue companies now. So I think that was the second thing, right? Thinking about category mix, thinking about product mix, thinking about pricing as well. I don't think people think of luxury the same way as they used to before. Again, that's another trend that's gotten aggravated. Nobody wants very expensive, uh, fancy uh, bags and shoes only for signal value. People want yeah. to signal that they are conscious consumers, they are smart consumers, they're buying sustainable products and things like that. So I think the way the consumer is thinking about signaling has changed also. And the last trend, I think, which is I find very interesting in beauty, right? There was a massive shift away from makeup yeah. to skincare. This was a year where hydration masks and how to make your, you know, oils for your skin and uh, acid uh, products, which would make acne uh, go away. And, you know, your focus on care was so much more than the focus on your appearance, which yeah. is, you know, up, uh, categories. Some of these shifts are uh, definitely, you know, were huge shifts in the COVID year and maybe some will adjust. But I actually think that um, this kind of change is, it tends to be permanent in nature, right? Like if you have made the consumer more confident about their choices and about how they want to dress and what they want to look like and how they want to interact with the brands, you've made them comfortable with interacting digitally with things that they would usually, you know, want to go to the store and physically feel. These are very, uh, these are very permanent shifts. So I think, um, you know, super winners and super losers and this whole industry has changed really fast. People care about the right things, people care about sustainability, people care about transparency, the right price, the right segments. It's all, I think it's all going to emerge. Uh, we're going to emerge on the other side with a cleaner, better fashion industry um, in maybe in 2022. Yeah, you make me think of um, Uniqlo story, right? I mean, life wear, affordable, comfortable, uh, you know, clean designs. And they're worth what, like 100 billion or something like that. Talk about winners and losers and so many other brands like H&M or even right. Zara have uh, struggled uh, against uh, the rise of uh, somebody like Uniqlo. And points to company cultures, right? What makes some see 
uh, what's coming and transform quickly and what makes others, despite obviously laudable past that they have, uh, when this kind of a crisis hits, which is unprecedented, unexpected, uh, it just creates a very fast nosedive, right? So if we think about this from a strong company cultures, obviously some things are easy to understand, diverse teams and inclusive cultures perhaps, so forth. But what are your philosophies or tips or hacks so that this will never happen to you? Vani, it helps to be paranoid, right? Like, I think we also went through a very... Time to grow, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so we went through a very tough time. We had to reorg the company a lot. Um, you know, I have personally faced both applaud and criticism for, uh, you know, how it was dealt with. I think uh, having courage after you've made a decision and constantly learning from your mistakes is, is necessary. So two things that have personally, like, helped me is knowing that you know, when a company, especially a startup, is is growing so fast, you will make mistakes. You Again, it, it goes back to the same thing as, you know, having a hypothesis around your product or business model and then not accepting that maybe your solution is not the best. And uh, when systems grow fast, when orgs grow fast, you have to, you have to accept that some things uh, are learning experiences and areas of development. And I think personally for me, what has held us in good stead is I think, you know, all the criticism we took very seriously uh, about how to run teams, um, how to hire, not to overhire, uh, not to underhire. We we made mistakes. We learned from them and we said, you know what? It's okay. Please criticize us. We will try and fix them. And we went back to the drawing board and fixed them because the, the reality is that today the world around us is changing very, very fast, right? Technology is making teams, uh, products, business models. Uh, you either evolve or you break. So, so having the approach of we have decided this is who we are and this is what we're going to do is, is actually a problematic approach. You have to have the approach of I will wake up every day and I will try to learn something new today because nobody really knows enough and nobody has day one answers anymore. Having that culture of like the key cultural value here is that of I think pushing for growth, not just of metrics, but of yourself, right? Like personal growth, having that mindset of listen, I need to learn because everything is changing so fast. We all need to learn. We all need to get up in the morning and say, okay, you know what? The world around us has changed. Somebody has innovated. Somebody is, you know, maybe sitting in China or in the US or somewhere, somewhere in Latin America may not even be around us who has developed something which has changed the basis of all of our hypotheses and products from yesterday, which is entirely possible. So I think uh, that is one, just having that agility and ability to grow every single day, accept that we've made mistakes in the past or, you know, what may not have been mistakes then are not relevant today and not like making sure you are growing every day so you don't become irrelevant. And that's the first thing. Second is, I think, just courage, right? I think a lot of startups went through a tough time last year. But having said that, I think a lot of traditional companies, to your point, went through a tougher time because actually having a lot of legacy and then maneuvering it with agility very quickly is is incredibly hard right so small startups benefited the most i think from last year's tailwinds because they could just quickly make decisions and go in that direction large companies you know maybe struggled a little bit more and traditional companies were the ones where you know even if they knew the right answer the red tape around them or you know the the corporate structures around them made it hard to pull off those decisions right like you have to convince a very large number of stakeholders before you make a huge shift and say listen i'm going to shut down all my shops and go on Instagram, right? So, you know, having the courage to make bold decisions in today's times, especially if you're in a business like retail or hospitality, where, you know, all your fundamentals have changed because of last year. It's easier said than done. I think, you know, sometimes the traditional companies know exactly what they need to do. You know, when we talk to people, when we are hiring people from traditional companies, they know exactly what the problem is and they know exactly what the solution is. But it's just that, you know, com some companies find it harder to move and be agile with times. And the opportunity for startups is huge. I always say between David versus Goliath, I always want to be David. <laughs> you know, that's the fun job. I think some companies, though, do it really, really well, right? Like, I think the big tech companies yeah. have uh, really kept up and kept up their speed of agility. They have startup within the startup culture, which is which is great. And maybe I think that's the solution. As the companies get bigger and bigger, having some parts of your teams dedicated to disrupting you so that somebody else doesn't do it first, maybe that's the solution. I think it's a fantastic thought. And like you said, the big tech 
have shown that is possible. And in India, of course, Jio has shown that it's possible even for an old company. But you know, Ankiti, you know you are rare. And so if we ask why you, right? I mean, just look at it from a global basis even. I was just checking this. There are like some 230 companies globally today that are worth over a billion dollars that are venture backed, right? So we're not talking about the big tech or the public companies or whatever. So, and about 30 of them have women at the lead, uh, that, that alone, but you are so young and you've done so much. And so you are, you know, a role model that many, many people uh, want uh, to, to, to follow and be. So why you, if you were to ask yourself that question, what made it happen? Vani, I, I think the question to ask is, why aren't there more Ankitis? We keep saying, uh, what is the way to solve this, right? And why, why Ankiti? I think, yes, definitely, um, you know, a place and time in life, courage, uh, the idea, access to capital changed everything. Uh, so, so the question becomes, how do we get enough women into the top of the funnel? And then how do we make sure that we are mentoring and coaching them enough and giving them access to capital to make mistakes, to fail, to go big, Right. Uh, and I think um, I think that's what I had. Uh, I had the right uh, coaches, investors, mentors. Uh, I got flexibility to not just make the right decisions, but also to make the wrong decisions uh, and learn from them. Because we are in an industry which is changing so fast that every decision can't be right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if, if I was to create a framework of sort of how do we get more women to run not just billion dollar companies, but $10 billion companies and create $100 billion companies. I think we need to, you know, focus on, uh, of course, we want, we want to focus on like the early and mid stages of the company where we need to make sure that enough women get access to capital and coaching um, and, and the room to uh, aim really, really big, which means that it's going to be a portfolio of some successes and some failures. And then, you know, net, net, if all you know broadly things work out, then really large outcomes can be created. Um, and I actually think that it's really important uh, to do this. I think bringing in diversity of gender and all forms of diversity actually in the leadership is 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 extremely important because the rooms where decisions are made, if they look more like the the audience that they're building for, um, actually I think we can maximize economic success a lot. Or, you know, even if we look at stakeholders, like in our industry, 60% of the workers tend to be female in garment factories, right? Uh, a lot of the consumer decisions are made by women. Um, yet, somehow, some of the largest conglomerates in fashion and lifestyle are mostly done by men. So as that shifts, there's definitely, and there's a, there's, a, you know, there's enough data around it that better economic decisions are being made by more diverse boards and more diverse leadership where there are more women included. So I think the question is just, you know, we know the right answer. Uh, we are sort of figuring out the framework that gets us there, which is, you know, more mentorship, more coaching and more capital. And Vani knows this. I think I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, you know, let's find the best women and give them access to coaching and capital and that'll change everything. And it's, I know it's a very simple answer, but I think it's a simple and good framework.